Welcome back everybody to Lichen Anatomy Part 2, where we'll cover some of the most important features for identifying lichen species. A brief note one more time, most of the slides in these two anatomy lectures were originally created by Dr. Lolita Calabria and Dr. Jesse Miller and have been used or modified with their permission to accompany the narration by me, Dr. Allie Weil. So in part one, we talked about the lichen thallus, its internal structure, and the main three growth forms. Uh, in this part, part two, we'll focus on a lichen's reproductive structures and a few other external structures. And the reproductive and other external structures are some of what make a lot of lichens look as cool as they do. Um, and they're pretty important to know if you want to identify any lichens beyond their most basic growth form. And if you flip through a lichen ID book, you're going to find that there are many, many more structures with names than we have time to cover here, and many variations on the ones that we will cover. So I'm just going to try to focus on the most important ones for identifying common lichens, and that's going to start with the reproductive structures. Okay, so the first thing to know is that lichens can reproduce either sexually through fungal spores or asexually through pieces of the thallus that contain both fungus and photobiont, and they break off together to form a new lichen. And there are different structures that facilitate either sexual or asexual reproduction, and lichens can do either or both, um, but species are sometimes defined by what reproductive structures that they do have. So the main structures that you'll see that are involved in sexual reproduction are called apothecia. Uh, apothecium is the singular. And if you want to be a cool lichenologist, you might call them apos for short. And apothecia are a really great place to start when learning lichen structures because they're really common and they're quite easy to identify. They're almost always circular and fairly regular in shape. Uh, they can be disc-like or cup-like or button-like, but they're usually round. Uh, sometimes that they're at the end of stalks and sometimes they have little cilia that make them look like something from Dr. Seuss. Uh, but if you see a round feature, that is probably an apothecium. And here are a few more examples of what apothecia can look like. Uh, look for the round things in all of these pictures. And in this one, you'll see that apothecia, uh, these little red things, they're on the ends of podicia, structure we talked about in part one, these little stalks. And here are some drawings of all the different shapes that apothecia can take. As you can see, most of them are round, uh, but not all of them. Those sort of squiggly ones in the middle are a notable exception. Uh, you see these in script lichens, which are given that name because of the, those oddly shaped squiggly apothecia. They look almost like letters. Okay, so moving on. So what does one of those apothecia look like inside? Uh, so an apothecium is a fruiting body. It's similar to a mushroom. So if you cut it open and you look under a good microscope, uh, you'll just see these sort of sac-like structures, they're called ASCII, or, um, into which spores are sort of packed in. So in this photo, they're in that section that's just below the bright yellow there, sort of lighter yellow area. And here, this is a close-up of that ASCII, uh, ASCIS. ASCIS is singular, ASCII is plural, um, containing those spores. Uh, so you can see the spores in there. And uh, some lichens can actually only be identified to species based on the shape of that ascus or the shape or the number of the spores themselves. Um, so it gets pretty tricky when you really want to get down to species for some types of lichens. Um, and one, while we're on this, one fascinating thing about spores is that they only contain fungal material. So when that spore is released into the world, it can only become a lichen if it finds the correct algae to partner with or cyanobacteria while that sport bar is still viable. So that seems pretty difficult. How can lichens possibly reproduce this way? Well, uh, we, so one thing is we don't know for sure, but uh, spores are really small, so you can make a lot of them, and they can travel uh, farther because they're so small and light. And in general, in biology, uh, sex is typically worth it for most organisms. Uh, the, because it introduces genetic diversity and that helps you adapt to changing conditions. Um, but still, it still seems pretty improbable and it's still kind of a mystery. Uh, some lichenologists have suggested that algae and 
are just a lot more common than we think. They're just sort of everywhere, so it's not actually that hard for a spore to just find an algal buddy. Um, but we don't really know, so stay tuned on that one. Um, yeah, and it's just the other fascinating thing about sexual reproduction in lichens is that we just really have very little idea of how it works. Um, we know how it works in non-lichenized fungi, but lichenized fungi have proved really difficult to study in the lab, so we, uh, we just don't really know how it works. Okay, so those are the apothecia. Um, there's some other types of sexual reproductive structures besides apothecia, but they're by far the most important and easiest to recognize, so we're going to leave the sexual structures there and move on to asexual reproductive structures. So a more straightforward way to reproduce if you're a lichen is to simply break off a piece of yourself that can then go forth in the world and then start a new thallus. It's like how some flatworms can regenerate entirely new bodies and even new brains if you slice them in half, or more familiar for you botanists out there, how you can grow new plants with things like cuttings. So um, asexual reproduction is great in general because you don't need to find a partner, sexual or symbiotic, and you can just split off parts of yourself. Uh, the downside is that the pieces can't travel quite as far and you don't get as much genetic diversity introduced. Uh, still, lichen fragments can still travel quite far in this way. Um, and for example, by hitching a ride on a far flying bird is a thing lichens do. Um, and in some cases, pieces of the thallus just do kind of break off to start new thalli. And you could maybe do this by cutting a piece. But lichens also have specific structures that facilitate this kind of reproduction, which we're going to get to now. So probably the most important asexual structures are called seredia. So seredia are these tiny balls of fungal hyphae enveloping a few photobiont cells. So they have both key partners in the lichen, so new lichen thallus can grow right away. And they can look sort of powdery or grainy, um, but they, you, they stand out distinct from the surface of the lichen because seredia don't have any cortex tissue, which is uh, often shinier. So seredia are often grouped into these little clusters, and those little clusters are called seralia. So seralia are distinct clusters of seredia. And they can occur sort of just on top of the cortex, or they can be on the margins or the tips of the lobes. There's a lot of different shapes. Um, but seredia can also just sort of be spread more widely across the thalus. They don't always occur in seralia. And sometimes seredia are like really obviously seredia um, is very distinctive, but there's also some other powdery types of features that can be a little confusing at first. Um, but still, if something looks like a blob of powder or little grains, kind of like if you dipped the lichen's edge in glue or painted some spots of glue and then dipped it in powder, um, that's, that's sort of what it looks like. Other asexual structures that contain both fungal tissue and photobiont cells are ascidia. So these ascidia, they're finger-like projections and they contain uh, cortex tissue, which seredia do not, and they sort of just look like a little narrow outgrowth of the thallus. Okay, so going back to this drawing that we had up before, you can see that there's a whole bunch of different asexual structures, but they're really all doing the same fundamental thing. They're breaking off bits of photobiont, that little black circle there, uh, and fungus together. And in the bottom row there, you can see that seredia, they're not covered by cortex, if you look closely, while ascidia and lobules, another structure that's pictured here, they do have that cortex included. And lobules, they're really just these very narrow lobes, usually growing horizontal to the thallus. Ascidia and lobules describe different shapes, uh, more so than fundamentally different structures. And in general, just don't get too caught up on determining whether a particular little outgrowth of the thallus is an ascidia or a lobule, or even a seralia or ascidia. The definitions can kind of blur together. Um, so just get a general idea for what these different things kind of look like. Now one more asexual reproductive structure that's probably worth knowing about are uh, pycnidia, uh, because they'll, they'll occur pretty commonly and some of the lichens will get to know. And pycnidia produce sort of a asexual spore called conidia. In practice, it looks like these little dark dots on the cortex. It's a little bit like an apothecium, um, but the spores it produces are asexual. 
here's a drawing so you have some idea of what's inside those little dots. Uh, but don't dwell on this too much unless you want to take a deep dive into the mysteries of lichen reproduction. Okay, that's it for reproduction today. We have a handful more structures to get through. For most of these, we're less concerned with their function, um, which in some cases may not be known uh, than what they look like, because uh, these are distinguishing features for many genera and species. Okay, so first off, one that we mentioned briefly in the first part of this lecture, rhizines. So rhizines are root-like structures attached to the lower cortex of a lichen, typically a foliose lichen. They are not, however, actually roots, like plants have roots. They do not transport anything. Um, so lichens get all of their water and nutrients from the air, and they absorb it through the cortex. Um, but rhizines are sort of similar to roots, only in that they anchor the lichen to its substrate, just as roots can anchor a plant to the ground. Um, and as you'll see in this drawing, rhizines can have these different branching patterns. They can be unbranched, they can be forked, or squaros. Uh, you can usually observe these branching patterns with a little hand lens um, or a microscope. Uh, similar to rhizines, but growing out from the margins of the lichen or around the edge of the apothecium um, instead of from the lower cortex are cilia. So cilia are these little hair-like projections. Um, they're pretty distinctive to some common lichens in the Bay Area, like Parmotrema. Uh, you can often see these with your naked eye, but sometimes you need to look pretty closely. All right, we are getting very close to the end. Okay, pseudocephalae and cephalae are the sort of small pits or breaks in the cortex. So cephalae are like these little craters, and they contain specialized cells, more sort of a regular specialized feature, while pseudocephalae are uh, more irregular sort of spots associated with cracks in the cortex. Um, we don't know that much about why they're there, but they're pretty important for identifying some common or interesting Bay Area species. Uh, Pseudocephalae is actually the more important one because they occur in more different kinds of lichens, where cephalae are really only limited to this one uh, fairly uncommon group. Another thing you might see on the surface of a lot of lichens are these very fine pale crystals called purina. A purina are a little tricky sometimes because you might mix them up with ceredia or a couple other little things, little powdery things. Um, but purina are typically finer and less clustered than ceredia, but it can be confusing at first. All right, finally a sort of cool one to close. So cephalodia are these gall-like growths containing cyanobacteria but they're found in mostly green algal lichens. So these lichens uh, have both types of photobionts. They have algae in most of the thallus, and then they have cyanobacteria in these little cephalodia. And they appear as these sort of dark, little dark spots on the thallus. Uh, the best way to know for sure what they are would be to you know, cut them open and look under the scope and see that there's cyanobacteria in there. But for our purposes, you'll sort of just want to know that to look for these irregular dark areas on the thallus if you think you might have a lichen that has cephalodia. Okay, so wrapping up, it's know this. Uh, it's less important to remember the names of all of these different things we've talked about than to just know that these types of things, these types of textures and structures, uh, that these are things worth observing and to make note of them if you want to identify the lichen. So if you run into a description of a lichen that's pruinous, you can always look that up. Uh, that's super easy to do. What's more important is that you're paying attention to all of the lichen's features and have some idea of what to observe so that when you go to identify it, um, you can match the things you observe to those descriptions. That said, there's uh, some key terms that are really good to know off the top of your head um, that I hope you'll remember after this lecture, and I would say those most important ones are apothecia, ceredia and cerealia, acidia, rising, and cilia. So if you have a good idea or some idea of what those are, you are doing great. All right, so thanks for tuning into this first set of lecture videos. Uh, you should now be prepared to watch any of the Meet the Lichens videos. Uh, to learn about common lichens in the Bay Area and beyond. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks also to Lolita Calabria and to Jesse Miller, who helped develop uh, some of the slides in these two anatomy lectures. And happy lichenizing. <laughs>